All right, it is 630 and time for our council work session on the street preservation program. This meeting is being held in person in consideration of the COVID-19 social distancing recommendations. This meeting is also available virtually via Zoom. Information is posted on missionks.org on how to join online. And we have one item on the agenda tonight that is street preservation program funding, Laura Smith. Thank you. Uh, and Celia and I are just going to kind of tag team this presentation this evening um, as we kind of go back and forth. So if we're, we didn't practice, um, we've talked through it, but, um, but again, uh, as with any work session, as we go along, uh, questions, discussions on any portion or part of this, please feel free to stop us and we're, we're happy to um, dive in a little deeper. But one of the things that really since um, we landed on consensus around the design and philosophy and approach to putting together uh, the current 10 year street program, which then allowed us to make the decisions about the rate at which we wanted to ask uh, our mission voters to approve the dedicated street sales tax. Um, the council has been um, asking and, and inquiring about what opportunities might we have to accelerate the residential street program uh, and tackle some of this work. So part of what we want to do this evening um, as part of our work session uh, for those who didn't have the benefit of going through all of those conversations with the council, we'll take just a few minutes to sort of recap and review how we got to the recommended program that we're currently working through. Uh, then that will include things like the current network condition, the factors that guided the decision making, and then just kind of a recap of based on the condition of a street, what a recommended treatment is. We'll look at our current street funding resources. We'll look at external funding opportunities. And so uh, one of the things, um, we have some very reliable funding sources historically uh, in partnership with Johnson County through the CARS program and the stormwater management program or SMAC as you often hear it referred to that we wanna talk about you know, where we are, um, what those cycles are, how sometimes they don't align with always our budget process or in this last year, as we were making decisions and moving toward getting this issue on the ballot, um, some of the timing was off. So we'll address some of those kinds of things. And then just with the, um, there's, a, there's so much federal money that is now available from an infrastructure perspective. So trying to educate ourselves, think about where we have opportunities um, to try to pursue uh, one of our favorite resources and that is other people's money. Um, then we'll talk, Silly, we'll talk a little bit about um, just the experience that we've had so far in designing and bidding and beginning construction on the 2021 and 2022 programs, what we're experiencing with respect to cost and particularly there, the relationship to some of the stormwater expenses related to the street. So we will spend a little bit of time kind of drawing in where we are both in our current stormwater revenues and how that might support or how we might want to use that to support the street program. Um, then we'll look at some future sort of funding decisions and opportunities included in your packet uh, were some debt, debt service scenarios that Ellers has prepared for us and we'll, we'll cover those in a little bit more detail. And then, um, really just look at kind of questions, discussions, what are our next steps? So as I referenced in the work session memo, we're not looking for any specific direction coming out of tonight's work session. We wanted to take this opportunity just to kind of get everybody up to speed. And as we head into the budget process and we think about, um, you know, the this, this, this street sales tax is set, but we have, you know, whether it's the mills that we're currently collecting and dedicating to streets, mill levy, stormwater utility fees, all of those kinds of things are gonna be part and parcel of our budget discussions between now and mid-September. Um, and so we just wanted to, to make sure that we got all of this out in front of you. So um, next slide and then next slide, please, Emily, sorry. So we wanted to start, I think most of you are familiar, um, with some of one of the primary sort of guides and um, influences 
in making the decision around the 10-year street program and particularly the renewal of the dedicated street sales tax and the increase in that from a quarter cent to three-eighths of a cent was based on our citizen survey results that are collected through the direction finder survey. So in the 2021, so we've, we've administered this survey every four years, generally since 2007, so 7, 11, 15, and then a little bit more of a gap to get to uh, 21. Um, but ever since the first direction finder survey, streets have been absolutely a top priority for the residents in our community. And that's not a surprise. We've had a lot of conversations around the deferred maintenance that's occurred um, and the need for that. But again, that was reflected very strongly in the 2021 direction finder survey. And you can kind of see this question 18 here. What are the three most significant issues you think mission will face over the next five years? And only behind affordable housing was the maintenance uh, of streets. So I think, you know, residents recognize that that's a challenge. They see that um, as an important issue for the city to tackle. And then one of the questions that we asked in um, the 2021 survey was of these areas, um, of potential increased city investment for either future current or future unmet needs, where would you potentially be willing to increase um, you know, city investment? And you can see in that case that maintenance of neighborhood streets ranked absolutely number one um, with over 80%. 89% of the respondents saying that was, you know, strongly agree or, um, or agree that that was, they would support increased investment in that. And then maintenance of our major thoroughfares came um, behind. And certainly the full direction finder results, uh, if you want um, an opportunity to just kind of review those in more detail are available on the city's website. But as I mentioned, these have helped over the years to guide our decisions. Um, they helped guide decisions related to um, the uh, first street sales tax. They helped guide decisions related to the conversion of the transportation utility fee to dedicated mills. Um, and I think this is something that we won't see probably change. Hopefully, if you know, maybe as we work through this next 10 year program, we might start to see as we see some improvement in some of those streets um, that this might be a lower priority for, from some of our residents, but certainly both in the residential neighborhoods uh, and in, um, you know, on the major thoroughfares, it's important. It's important for our residents. It's important for our businesses. Uh, it's just uh, important for the overall sort of economic health and vitality of our community. One of the things that we didn't include in here, be happy if you're interested, to go back and share and some of the other presentations that we did leading up to placing the sales street sale tax on the ballot there was some information about what we've spent the 10 years prior on investments in streets so it's not we've been making a lot of investments many of those you know 10.6 million dollars on johnson drive martway lamar Knoll, row so we've done a lot of the major arterials and collectors um, at the expense of the residential streets. And in part, as we go through tonight, I think we all remember that's because many of them were not built to specific standards and require full depth reconstruction. And um, the expense to tackle that is pretty significant. So with that, I'll turn it over to Celia for several slides just to kind of recap current street network and condition. Good evening. Um, if you have questions, feel free to ask me as I go, or you can wait till the end. Um, so a recap of our current street network. Um, this is uh, familiar to all those that were on the council at the time, but hopefully it's a reminder of where we came from and what our decisions were made. And then any of the new council members, if you have any questions as we go. So we have I say approximately, but 89.3 lane miles in the city. And so like Johnson Drive, instead of just one mile, that includes each lane. So that would be four, four lanes of miles. Um, 
The majority of our streets are local streets, as you can see. Um, so we have uh, arterials that are like Johnson Drive, uh, Rowe, Fox Ridge, um, those major streets that are uh, carrying all our traffic. Um, and then you have collectors, and those are um, 56, 58th, 55th, and 53rd that take the um, traffic from the local streets, put them onto the collectors, and then distribute those to the arterials. Um, typically, a collector would not have any direct access on it, but since we have streets that were built in the 50s, you know, there's a lot of residential drives, so that's why sometimes we get complaints about traffic because it feels like a collector, but then you have residential drives off of it. Um, and then our locals are just those shorter, you know, obviously the residential streets that have shorter blocks. Um, I know that Laura sent out a memo that talked about the order of magnitude cost based on a Stantec study. And I think we had revised the number since then. So our total, if we were to go out and we had $41 million to fix all of our needs, that would satisfy our needs today. Um, and that includes pavement, um, an estimation on curb, sidewalk, and ADA ramps. So that's kind of a scary number, but what we do is we just kind of break it down and do what we can every year. Um, but it just gives us an idea of, you know, what are our total needs are. And I did update the memo. Oh, you did? So if you've downloaded it, you may want to download it again. So I went in today and updated that number to be reflective of that. As you'll recall, we had so many revised Stantec tables right. uh, over the course of several months. Um, and, and so that has been updated to be reflective of that $41 million. Okay. It is 41, not 38.5, which was in the memo. Yep. So it's just the, the existing sidewalks and the curb and the sidewalk was kind of a, our best estimation because I couldn't walk every street. And so what I did is looked at a number of the streets and walked and kind of got an estimate of how much curb need to be replaced. So when I go over these numbers later, you're going to see I was a little off on some of them um, and sidewalk too. So that's part of our discussion later. Yes. Well, just the pavement and the curb part of it, not all if we do a lot of other amenities and traffic signals and stormwater and things like that. Sure. I have a question and mine's going to be off the cuff. I, something I've always looked at and being on this council for a long time, the longevity and the parameters defined around what the maximum street usage is for the period, most of them no more than last more than 10 years. Are we currently looking at other options for other materials on the road? I don't ever hear that. I mean, besides chip and seal, but so I, I mean, is there anything that is more long lasting that's being looked at in the, in the public works arena right now? We're always looking. And some cities have more staff to be able to look like Olathe, you know, that's their full-time job, one person, always looking at all the different options to do. And UBAS is one of those that kind of came on, you know, out of nowhere. So everybody's always looking to see what's the best option. And, you know, it used to be slurry seals were popular. Right. No, those don't work as well. So it's an ongoing thing. And in fact, we have a um, committee of the different cities that is coming up with a new asphalt mix. And so the cities are getting together and combining it. So everybody's always talking about what's the next best thing. Okay. Thanks. Mm -hmm. And a couple of things. So it's interesting, like with UBAS, it took us, even though that was here, the contractors didn't have the equipment to do UBAS treatments on residential streets. And so it, it, there's a trickle down. So there's always kind of a lag in that process. And I think there's a slide here in just a little bit that kind of talks about that useful life. But the other thing, Celia, that um, I know we've talked about, and I know you have in progress, is the development of specific standards for the construction of our streets. So you may want to at whatever point you think that makes some sense, kind of give an update on that yes. process. Oh, our specifications. Specifications, yes. So I'll just mention it right now. So um, I had high hopes of getting that done at the end of the year. And we 
met with what we're doing is we're looking at Overland Park specifications um, and we're trying to modify those for um, us because they have a lot of other things that we do. So we've had one meeting and gone through them all, but we need to go again. So I'm hoping by summer to get those done. So right now when we do a street project, we say, oh, refer to Overland Park standards, but it's kind of weird. And so <laughs> we need to get our own. So we are working on that and we'll have that done definitely this year. But everything that we've that we are constructing and have constructed in the last ten years has been done to someone else's standards. So it's not been done without standards. Um, we just need to, as Celia mentioned, get them modified to fit mission specific. Yeah. Okay. So um, talked about the stand tech study. So what they did is they have specialized equipment that they drive each street and they have computers that take pictures and they measure the roughness and the distresses and it's a scientific process and they come up with an, a pavement condition index or PCI. So we have one, a PCI for each street and that kind of drives how we select our streets for construction. But the overall network is 56.1. And that's based on a scale of zero to 100. And so 56.1 is um, in the fair category. It's actually the lowest number of fair before it goes to poor. So um, it's a little bit hard to see this graph, but um, we have 28% of streets that are good or satisfactory, meaning 70 or above. Then we have in that mid-range 23% fair. And then 49% of our street are very poor, serious, or failed. So we've got a lot of work to do, but at least this gives us an idea of where we are. Yeah. Do we have any other cities PCI scores that we can compare ours to, particularly in our area? Um, I did, <laughs> um, but I don't have them right now, but I can go back and get, because Stantec does a lot of the cities, so they gave me a lot of that information before. You know, like Olathe's goal is to have everything be a 70 and above, and they're not there yet, but, you know, um, I'd have to look at, I'd have to get that information for you. Okay. Next slide. So when we had these work sessions in 2020 and 2021, I think, um, we, had, we decided on some decisions that would guide our program. So one would be, uh, let's prioritize building our residential street program, fixing the worst first. So let's look at the PCIs and let's go fix those first. Um, and sometimes it depends on stormwater. So if you have to stop, start at the bottom of the street to build storm up, and so sometimes, you know, you may look at the PCIs, but there's a reason we have to sequence them sometimes. But in general, we're looking at the worst first. Um, we also are allocating $2 million annually for the residential street program. And um, also we decided to develop a separate program for arterial. So um, that's separate from the 2 million that we're allocating. And really a lot of that is coming from our Johnson County cars program where they give us 50% for construction. And so later on, I'll talk a little bit about more about the cars program. Um, we also looked at, well, what if we put sidewalks on every street? And really, if we did that, I mean, that would be great for pedestrian connectivity, but unfortunately, we'd be spending all our money and not have as much for streets. So after some of that discussion, uh, the other thing is um, everybody wants sidewalks, but they don't always want it on their side because then it tears down their big trees or those the lots that don't have enough frontage and all of a sudden it's taken up with the sidewalk. So at this time, we decided to repair what we have. And then let's take a look at a standalone sidewalk plan. So looking at uh, destinations like parks and schools and downtown area, maybe there's some opportunities where we want to build connections of new sidewalks. And then incorporating ADA considerations for each street as feasible. So a lot of times when we go into a street and 55th street is one of the um, examples that we, uh, the driveway slopes don't meet ADA, the sidewalks don't meet ADA, there's power poles in the sidewalk, there's signs in the sidewalk. And so let's try to fix that as we go. Um, and then as far as stormwater, um, in retrofit areas, which we're talking about existing streets, um, incorporating minimal improvements for stormwater. So if you had a new street, there's APWA guidelines of you have to look at 
how much st storm water there is and you space the inlets and you size the inlets based on keeping uh, seven, seven inches of storm water off the road. And so in this case, we did some test cases and looked at that and decided, okay, um, for our streets, what we're gonna do is each street, we're gonna look at the issues on the street instead of just automatically putting in a system um, and it's kind of to save money too, but looking at, you know, are there drainage issues? And if so, let's go ahead and put in that stormwater system, but we're not gonna just design to the new standard. Um, next slide. This, these maps are a little bit hard to read, and I don't know if you've got some copies in your handout or I can get them for you, but these were developed by Stantec, so they're not as nice and pretty, and they don't have the names of all the streets, but the first one is a PCA, PCI condition map, and so it shows each street by color, um, and the blue are the good streets, and as you can see, those are kind of the arterial streets because we've had the CARS program to do that. Um, the yellow are the fair to poor, and then the red are the very serious or failed streets. The second um, slide is the treatment that we're recommending right now. So the black ones are the streets that we just did. So those are the do nothing streets right now. And then the blue are the cracks. The light blue is the crack fill where that's what we do in house. And we go in and we add, um, <clears throat> we fill the cracks with an asphalt sealant and that prevents the moisture from penetrating into the pavement and forming a pothole. So that's done in house and you typically would do that one to three years after a new street. And then right now we have yellow as granite seal or chip seal as most people know it. Now that's one of those that I think there's further discussion, but really what we showed on those streets are the PCIs are a little bit higher and it's a really good preventative maintenance. It seals the surface of the street, but it's not always desirable for people because it depends on the, um, the uh, temperatures, whether the rock is embedded in the asphalt or you've got a lot of rocks and chips and then you have to sweep those up. So I think when it comes to that time, we talk about whether we wanna do it. I mean, it's more cost, effect, cost effective and Overland Park does it, but there's always a lot of complaints. So right now we've shown those and I think that requires further discussion at that time. Um, and there may be a new treatment that's available. Pardon? There may be a new treatment as Debbie referenced. There could be something that's, yeah, more palatable for the, the residents by the time we get to addressing those chip seal streets. Right. Um, and then the next one, the other color blue is U-Bass, and that's what we did on Lamar. And that's an ultra thin bonded asphalt surface that, that helps extend the life of the road. And it's a five eighths inch thin asphalt layer that um, is put onto the street that prevents the water leakage and, and, and bonds to the old asphalt. And so um, that's the latest technology, but it's a five, eight inch, five eighths inch. So sometimes you don't, you wanna use that on a better PCI street. Um, and then you have the mill and overlay and that's your typical take off two inches on the surface and put in two inches of new asphalt. So that's a two inch surface versus the five eighths inch. And both of those, we typically would do base repair depending on the PCI um, and to help you know, fix the base and then we focus on the surface. And then we have full depth of reconstruction, which is three fourths of our streets. And those are the big, in the big bolded red. And the primary, re primary reason that we have all those re full depths is because we don't have sufficient asphalt. So typically to carry the load of traffic, you want eight inches on a um, residential road, 10 on a collector and 12 on an arterial. And we went through and did some borings um, five years ago or so for all our streets. So we know what it is. And unfortunately, most of our streets don't have enough asphalt. A prime example, <clears throat> not to pick on crunchy side, <laughs> but it has two inches of asphalt and you can really tell when you, when you drive the roads. And so that's one reason that we're focusing on, you know, on some of the streets and countryside is because of that. Next slide, please. So this is just kind of sort of a summary of what I talked about with the PCIs and you kind of see, you know, the different treatments and as you go up, you consider um, different treatments and lifespan. So your chip seal is 
well, your crack fill, you know, one to three years for preventative maintenance, just to extend the life. And then the granite or chip seals about five to seven, the U bass is about eight to 10 and the millen overlay is 10 to 15. Um, same with the full depth reconstruction, because really that's the purpose of if your pavement's just failed or you don't have enough asphalt, that's when you do it. And you look at that 10 to 15 year lifespan. Now for our streets, <clears throat> a number of our streets, like our um, residential streets are really short blocks. So you don't get the traffic. So we may extend the life a lot longer than that, but that, those are kind of typical industry standards. Next so, yeah. slide. Can you give us like a rough, rough idea what the cost difference is for the, those treatments? Darn it, I had that in the slide. Um, I don't know if I have it in front of me right now. You will? Okay. Yeah, um, if Laura doesn't find it, then we'll I'll get back with you on that. Okay, Laura, you're up. One of the things that Celia didn't mention is, you know, she talked about approximately three fourths of our residential streets requiring the full depth reconstruction. This is how I know she's so much taller than I am. Um, and, you know, there's not a, uh, go back one slide, please. So we didn't put a service life in years on those full depth reconstructions. That's because essentially when you go in and re completely rebuild that street, um, then you're kicking that street into the life cycle. And I mean, you shouldn't, if when we're building them to the appropriate standards, we shouldn't have to come back and completely rebuild that street again. So you then move into some of these other lesser um, maintenance treatments throughout that street's life cycle. Um, okay, next slide, please. So we, we wanted to touch a little bit uh, on just a reminder of what our current street program revenues are, those that are sort of generated internally by us. Um, first, we dedicate um, and have since 2015 when we converted the transportation utility fee uh, to um, property tax mills. It was the equivalent of about seven mills at that time. And so since 2015, we have continued each year to, to take a portion, of our property tax revenues in the general fund that equal those seven mills uh, and transfer that into our capital improvement fund specifically for street maintenance. Now, there's been natural growth because of the natural growth in our assessed valuation between 2015 and 2022, that seven mills in 2015 was about $750,000. So you can see that we've been able just by being able to take advantage of that growth and that, that we've reinvested that growth uh, in those mills um, back into those important infrastructure projects. So we're estimating in 2022 that that's gonna be somewhere in the neighborhood of 1.1, probably closer to $1.2 million. Then last September, we renewed the 38 cent sales tax, which actually sun, the quarter cent sales tax that was put in place 10 years ago actually sunsets tomorrow. And the new sales tax will take place on, or go into effect on um, Friday, April 1st, and will be in place for the next 10 years. So we'll sunset uh, in April of 2032 or March of 2032. And you may recall through some of those conversations that we can't go beyond a 10 year horizon for a special dedicated sales tax. So we will be in a continual renewal cycle if that is a funding resource that we want to use. And again, part of the decision in using the sales tax, I think you're all familiar, but it's something that's, it's a revenue stream that's generated um, and other people coming into our community to shop or do business are also helping to contribute to that. And when you think about the Target, the Hy-Vee, the county office building, the driver's license bureau, there are a lot of people that come into our community um, and impact um, the quality of our streets. But that increase from a quarter cent to three eighths of a cent um, roughly gave us about an additional $300,000 a year. So we went from about $600,000 to this 990 if we see sales tax performance in 2022, like we did in 2021, that will be over a million dollars in that 3.8 cent sales tax. So again, these numbers are conservative. 
Um, and then we still are receiving annually special highway funds, which is a portion of state gas tax that is passed, those are passed through revenues um, that equate to about $250,000 a year. So right now, as we sit in the 2022 budget, we have about 2.3 um, million, almost $2.4 million um, that we have in terms of dedicated street funding. Next slide, please. And then back to. So I wanted to talk to you about external funding opportunities. Um, and we have Johnson County, we have the CARS program and the stormwater management program. And I'll talk about those in a little more detail on next slides. We also have uh, federal highway administration funds, and those are sub allocated through uh, the Mid-America Region Regional Council. And those are three different pots of money, the STP, CMAC, and transportation alternatives. I'll talk about that in a little more detail. Um, Biden just passed, and Congress, I guess, not just Biden, passed the Building a Better America uh, by bipartisan law. And uh, we have a fact sheet where there's, oh gosh, 25 different funding opportunities, um, but they really vary and they're very specific. You know, they go from buses and clean energy and broadband and cyber and there's transportation too. Um, a lot of times those programs, and we're keeping an eye on those to see what is appropriate for us to apply for, but a lot of time they're really looking for those regional big bang projects. Um, when I was at another city, I applied for three different Tiger grants on an interchange that I thought, you know, okay, this project is going to get it. And then we didn't get it there. So those are great opportunities that we're going to keep an eye out, but we just, you know, it just depends on the other projects that are out there. Um, and everyone's applying for that funding. Um, the other uh, funding, there's other options. Um, we did apply for a base grant, which is um, uh, funded by the Kansas Department of Commerce and that we applied for Fox Ridge. And I think we're supposed to hear about it in the next week or so, whether we got the project. And then there's ARPA funds. And so there's other opportunities out there too. So we're always trying to keep an eye out to see what we can do. Typically, these grants probably wouldn't fund local streets. They're more like an arterial, like a Johnson Drive, Metcalf to Lamar, because that's more of a regional project. Next slide. So talking about the Johnson County um, programs, we have CARS, and um, that's funded by a share of state gas tax and county revenues, and those provide up to 50% matching funds for construction for CARS eligible routes. So uh, we have a list, and this is actually going to be coming to you on the May agenda. It comes every year for discussion. Um, but the CARS routes, like I said, are Johnson Drive, Roland, Roland Drive, uh, Fox Ridge, Row, et cetera, Nall. And so those are the projects. And that's why when you look at that map, those streets are probably in better condition than some of our local ones because we have the funding. Um, we're required to submit a five-year plan annually in April or May. And the first year, so <clears throat> this year we're going to submit for 2023-2027. And 23, the first project is set in stone. So that's going to be Fox Ridge. So we have to be very detailed on the cost estimate. And we're currently under design with that right now anyway. But the next four years are kind of a placeholder that we have opportunities to change around. And so, um, but that helps give them an idea of what we're looking at. And typically, <clears throat> excuse me, we receive funding for our top project and we usually get our 50%. But last year, they kind of changed. There's a lot more competition and a lot more people submitting or cities submitting projects. So um, for example, we submitted for cars on Johnson Drive, Lamar to Row. We asked for $695,500. We only got $622,000. So they're really kind of cutting back. And so when um, we're, we were hoping to get like $2.6 million for Fox Ridge next year, now I don't really know what we're going to get. It's really based on this 80% rule which is kind of confusing, but what they do for each city, they look at your funding is based on the city population and the property valuation. And then what they do is they look at your five last five projects and how much you spent. And um, 
you should only have about 80% of all that funding of the city population and valuation. And so that's why they cut back our project. I know that 80% rule is still kind of confusing to everybody, but they come through and they look at it every year. So that's why we're not confident yet of what we're gonna get on Fox Ridge. Um, stormwater management plan, that's funded with a 10th of a 1% sales tax. And that they just changed the program. So now we can get funds for replacing aging pipes. And based on this rating of three to five, or it's one to five from NASCO, but they will fund the three to five pipes, um, fair to failed. And uh, they won't pay for sizing, um, upsizing the pipe, but they'll pay for, pay for replacement in kind. And so <clears throat> we submit funding in January for the following year. Um, we've, for 2022, we're going to get up to $205,000. Um, and then um, I think I, we applied for 285,000 in 2023. So we'll see what we get there. We'll find out soon. And then they also, um, <clears throat> we apply for infrastructure inspections. So some of our pipe we just inspected, we applied uh, for a little more funding to do some of our older 2009 pipes because we found out that a lot of those have failed. And so we are starting to get a bunch of sinkholes on those pipes. So we'll see what we get um, when they let us know. And then there's flood control projects too, like Rock Creek. So those are a lot of opportunities for us to obtain funds. And we're using those stormwater funds on our local streets. And Celia, those um, inspections will allow us to upgrade the ratings and have a better sense of where our stormwater is at. Is that yes. right? Yes. Yes. Next slide, please. So um, here's the Federal Highway Administration. I talked about the three different programs at top, um, and those are through Mark. <clears throat> The call for projects is occurs every two years for future federal fiscal years. And so that's our opportunity to submit projects. Um, and what happens is we submit projects, the MARC staff ranks them, and then committees um, made up of each of the cities will make recommendations and to a final committee who makes final decisions on funding. I'm part of the STP funding committee, and it's always kind of a fun thing where you're jockeying your projects to try to get as much as you can, but you also have to work with the other cities, so it's always a fun time of year. Um, the rating criteria has changed and evolved over time. So it used to be that <clears throat> we'd submit a mill and overlay and you'd make it, you'd probably get some funding, but they've changed it to really focus on green infrastructure, vulnerable populations, a lot of, you know, alternative transportation modes, um, a lot of things like that. So on Johnson Drive, you know, you can't just submit the project. You need to meet that criteria or you're not going to get the highest rating and get your project funded so looking at more trees you know more si wider sidewalks um uh, bmps and things like that that add money to the project and make the project valuable but it's just it it just adds more you know money to the project and so we're really looking at johnson drive going how are we going to fund this project but we you know we really rely on hoping to get stp funds for it um, and then these programs will pay up to 80% of eligible project costs. And typically the STP project pays for construction only. And then, like I said, so it'll rank the projects and say, oh, these 10 projects are going to get funded. And if you ask for 6 million, you may get three or four, depending on what the committee says. So it's, it's, um, it's kind of a a process to know what you're going to get. So yeah, I had one question related to that. I okay. think when I was looking at Mark's um, website about this, they had something about prioritizing projects that align with their regional priority plan. I forget its exact name. Have we heard anything from Mark on whether that approach is still consistent with the new adjusted federal standards that you're talking about, or will they perhaps be changing that in light of the changes to the federal? Um, they, application. Standards. They just updated the criteria and they, you know, at least for this funding cycle, they're not changing. And I think they're tweaking it as they go. So they continue to, you know, look at climate action and things like that and incorporate those requirements, like the zero accident. It's a connected KC 2050 plan. And we have Johnson Drive projects submitted in that plan. So you get points for having that on the plan. So they do. So I know equity. So the, yeah. the environmental impacts, climate action, 
the equity considerations are all part of the new, you know, um, building, building, I can't, building a better America. And so those will change over time. And we're seeing those change even from this Johnson Drive project, our last S STP application, um, which, and I think it's due Friday. Friday. Um, for this next round, Celia is having to go back and, and layer on some of those new considerations. So they, yeah, can, they yeah. can keep up with that. That makes sense. And I guess I was just wondering, yeah, if that approach of giving the points to the connected 2050 projects was still viewed by Mark as consistent with the new standards. And it sounds like yes, but they'll yes. be sort of making adjustments as yes. they need to. But it makes it harder to get funding now. <laughs> um, next slide, please. So this is more of a breakdown of those three different pots of money. So STP, you can kind of see the different projects that you can apply for, <clears throat> transportation, highways, bridges, et cetera. CMAC is more looking at air quality and mitigation. So a lot of bicycle ped, diesel retrofit, traffic flow, and transit. The surface transportation block grant program set aside, which used to be access active transportation. I don't know why they changed it, made it more <laughs> of a mouthful, but that's really more planning, design, and construction of sustainable places, trails, safe routes to school, et cetera. So those are all opportunities too. Um, <clears throat> and for this phase, which is due on Friday, so the application submitted in two phases. April is the first more general one. So you are highly aligned, aligned, or I can't remember what it, the next one's like not aligned. And so um, when we originally applied for Johnson Drive last year, we were highly aligned. So I'm hoping that we're highly aligned again, but we're applying for funds for fiscal year 2025, 2026. And you can see the available pots of money, which sounds like a lot, but there's always a lot more projects than funding available. So it's always, you know, doing everything you can to get to the top of the list. Julia, I have a question. Would, would there be any consideration given when we're doing like a full depth reconstruction to looking at burying utility lines on any of those streets? On our arterials? Mm -hmm. um, so I don't know if, um, I don't know if these programs would pay for that. I know that when I did a project in another city, it was about a million dollars to bury a electric line underground. I would think there would have to be a discussion about environmental benefits to having them buried versus overhead. But I would think that would go into maybe the sustainability component of, of infrastructure. Yeah. I mean, we'll have to definitely look at that. Thank you. Next slide. Oh, go ahead. On the uh, STBG, vegetation management what is what's included in that i don't really know for sure i was just reading a fact sheet and I don't, i've never seen anybody apply for that <laughs> honestly yeah, i'm just wondering about the uh the k dot right away where we're having to manage some of mm -hmm. the trees along that i didn't know if that was if that qualified yeah i'll have to look at that um Typically, you see trails and safe routes to school, and I don't. I that it had that on there, and I was like, I had never heard of that. So we'll have to look at that. Okay, Laura. So I found the numbers for the comparison of between the the variety of street treatments. So let me back up to that. Now these are numbers not based on the actual bids that we've seen, but as just kind of a general order of magnitude, <clears throat> excuse me, um, a UBAS treatment is going to be roughly six, let's say $7 a square yard, a mill and overlay $20. So almost three times more expensive for mill and overlay over a su surface seal type treatment. And then 80, somewhere between 80 and $85 a square yard for full depth. So four times more expensive than that mill and overlay. So that kind of gives you a perspective of how those costs uh, can transition over time. Yeah, perfect. Yes, it's it's less than a dollar a square. No, that was crack seal. I'll have to go back. I found the PowerPoint and I closed it, but I'll find that again. Um, Okay, 
Uh, a couple of things before I talk about just sort of what guys or influences our big project, because I think it's important um, it, it, for some who've been around for a while, kind of know our history in securing funds through CARS, through SMAC, through the STP program, um, through a variety of other sources. Um, we've been very um, aggressive and I think successful in the previous 10 years in securing um, whether that whether it was for street infrastructure or stormwater infrastructure, uh, many of those projects. On the stormwater side, the city of Mission for many, many years did not make application to the Johnson County SMAC program, in part because one of the requirements was a competitive bidding process. And um, that was not always something that, as I've understood it, or it's been explained to me that the city wanted to follow. So following revision of the FEMA floodplain maps in the early 2000s, which put $51 million worth of property in our community in now 100 year floodplain, uh, the council mayor, council city administrator at that time were very aggressive in going to DC and talking with any resources we could to help kind of start to solve that problem. And so we actually um, received I can't I don't have the number right in front of me, but we got over $7 million. So when you think about that 80% rule that Celia was explaining, which is really convoluted and confusing, even for those of us who've worked with the program for many, many years, the county was very generous in allowing us to catch up for all of those years of not applying for stormwater funding. And so we actually, over the course of um, a three-year period, they allocated a little over $2 million each year. And most of that money was used um, to acquire properties and tear them, demolish them and just take them out of the floodplain exclusively. Um, so that's, so we're now in a position with SMAC where we can't say, well, we didn't get money for a whole lot of years. And so we're kind of back in that mix uh, with everyone else and, and that as, um, as resources become more limited. And I think the other thing that has happened that through various recessions or throughout the course of the pandemic, oftentimes there were cities who didn't have the matching funds to take advantage of the county programs. And so there was more money available. We always managed to come up with the matching funds to be able to show up at the doorstep and take advantage of, of some of those programs. So we got, um, as I said, close to $7 million for property acquisition. We got $2 million in SMAC funding to fund the installation of the interceptor on the first um, section of uh, the Johnson Drive project. Um, we got STP funding for that portion of the Johnson Drive reconstruction along with CARS funding. So we brought every dollar possible to the table um, that we could. We had STP funding for the Martway project that was um, done, we had, I can't even remember, you know, every, every time you go through a federal funding cycle, they come up with these really clever names and acronyms and it, it's hard to remember all of them. Um, but we took advantage of uh, federal dollars to do some work on Roe um, and I believe on Null. And then um, we were part of a regional effort through the Johnson Drive Shawnee Mission corridor with several other communities and taking advantage of Tiger Fund, Celia referenced those for another project um, that she did when she was in Olathe to do the transit center and put the, the transit stops um, at the various locations uh, along Martway at the now at Legacy Park. And, and the, so we've, we've, again, been very aggressive in taking advantage of those. Um, but we kind of caught ourselves up. And so now we're, we're really contending with everybody else you know, through this process. And we really are seeing for the first time in many years, the county dialing back um, you know, the request. So again, there's, there's kind of this push and pull through the process and what is the timing and when do we apply and how does that match up with our budget process and how does that match up with our long range planning? Um, the other thing that plays into that, particularly when you look at some of the funding 
that happens through the Mid-America Regional Council. If you look at that on a two-year cycle, think about the turnover on councils that happens for us. And so oftentimes you may make application. And one of the things that often has to accompany your application is a letter of support from your governing body. If you have a dramatic shift in your elected officials, um, which has happened to us in mission before, we've returned money, grant money that has been awarded to us because it was no longer a priority of the then sitting council. So the, those are some of the things that become challenging for us just with the timing and the management of that and quite honestly, reputation as we apply for, you know, for grants. So one of the things that we just wanted to touch on tonight, because I think it is an ongoing conversation and we have some work to do in some of these areas, but what guides or influences our decisions around the big projects that we do? And I think it's a variety of things. Our comprehensive plan, um, and you know, we're in the, the process of trying to, to get the most current version across the finish line, but oftentimes you look at, you know, what are, what are your big goals and your projects there? Um, but it can be other visioning plans and studies. So for example, in um, the form-based code, the West Gateway visioning study was, um, for example, where there were special study areas related to streets, one of those being the Johnson Drive Metcalf intersection and this concept of bringing that down at grade. So that's been hanging around for 10 plus years uh, as a potential. We've had some limited conversation as a governing body about that. I've heard mixed reviews about you know, where that might be in a priority, but we need to start to, I think, pull some of those threads of the bigger projects and come back and say, what's important to us? Um, you know, wh what do we want? We aren't a big enough city. It's challenging for us to do, spend a lot of dollars on studies and plans because it takes away from actually what we're trying to accomplish in any particular fiscal year. So, a, a, you know, a larger city may have shovel ready projects that they've identified and they can pull the plans off the shelf. And when some of these funding opportunities come along, it's, it's much easier for them to apply for those. They also have bigger budgets to play with. So as we submit for cars projects, as we submit for any other grants, the matching funds are required. And so we can't overcommit the dollars that we have um, on, on matching funds. So again, but I think that's certainly something that over the course of this next year, I think it would be very beneficial for us to start thinking about some of those bigger projects. So they feed into the five-year CIP. Um, there's also considerations in Mark's long range uh, transportation plan, um, because as Celia mentioned, if you increase your chances of funding, if you have a project that then gets incorporated into their long range plan, um, we think about current or future development projects and the impacts that those might have, particularly in this case on the, you know, the street network and then our annual, uh, annual budget cycle and process. So all of these things kind of you know, feed in, but I think it's worth, um, again, as I said, as we move forward, taking the time to do some additional discussion, study, look, evaluation about what are our dream big projects, if you will, right? So that as the opportunities come along, as they do um, periodically, particularly with an influx of um, federal grant dollars, that we might be best positioned to kind of take advantage of that. Next slide, please. I think we're back to Celia. I have a question, Laura. In, in that lowering the uh, Metcalf to grade, does not that require Overland Park's agreement? Because part of that is Overland Park. Yes. Yes. So, so it's owned and maintained by KDOT, okay. but Overland Park has a portion and so do we. And about a month ago, one of the consultants called me and said that they're submitting a, a request for proposal for repairing or redoing the bridge on Metcalf. And I was like, what? We're, we were talking about at grade. So I called KDOT and I said, 
we would like you to first notify us and get us involved in this, even though it's not ours, it's in our city and it impacts us. Um, but we'd like you to do a study to tell us, you know, whether that makes sense, because I have personal concerns about bringing that to a grade. We really have to look at the traffic impacts. Like right. what are, what's, if you put a signal there, you know, what is that going to do to traffic? And they're like, oh, we'll talk about the different departments and get back with you. And I need to call them again, because I also said we have concerns about 56, 58, um, <clears throat> what is it 61st by target you know all of those things and so um that would be the process that you know and typically if if it goes to at grade then sometimes kdot you know they would love to turn that over to us they would love to turn shawnee mission parkway over to us because they want to focus on the highways um yeah. and so we you know whatever we ask if it's going to cause more of a traffic impact or they may say okay but it's yours and so but we still need to look at that analysis to see if it makes sense i mean so i've asked them to do that and i need to continue that conversation again but it, it would take all the parties Okay, thank and, you. And I had a related question. I know Laura mentioned, you know, the costs of planning, but that is one hope for the new bipartisan infrastructure law is that there will be more funding opportunities potentially for planning projects um, as well as actual execution, right? Yeah, that'd be great. Um, before I get started on this slide, Brent, um, Brent uh, said that the chip seal is about $2 per square yard. So, 250 2017 so but the thing you need to know about chip seal is that that is when your base is good and all you are is protecting the surface so there's always the base repair so a lot of our streets that have been chip sealed they just chip sealed the surface and then underneath is the issue so <clears throat> Um, so this slide is just kind of focusing on our experiences in the last two years. So for 2021, um, we, based on Stantec's order of magnitude costs, so they had pavement, curb and gutter, sidewalks, and ADA ramps, um, we took that and then assuming the $2 million for local streets, um, added in 23.5% for contingency inflation design and inspection. And that's kind of how we sort of build out our draft 10 year program. And we assumed that stormwater would be paid for out of the utility fund or the partial Johnson County reimbursement. Um, <clears throat> if you look at the table above, it shows that we did, um, our actual lane miles were the same as our estimated lane miles. And, but we were. 53% over Stantec's costs versus bid price. I wasn't expecting that big of a jump. Um, and a lot of it is just costs, costs are skyrocketing and uh, due to inflation and supplies and other field costs. Um, and the contractors are really concerned with the gas prices because that feeds into higher asphalt prices. So there's a lot of uncertainty in the prices right now that make everybody nervous. But for 2021, stormwater, um, was a 19% increase and we couldn't get Johnson County funds for that because we would have had to apply for the year before and we hadn't made decisions on our street program. Um, driveway approaches were about 3%. Curb and gutter, um, that I was a little bit off. I, I used a, you know, assumption for Stantec like 50 or 60% would be replaced. But um, of the 2021 projects, um, two streets, were Dearborn, 63rd Terrace and Millhaven, 60th Terrace, which is south of Shawnee Mission Parkway and 53rd Place. And especially the streets in Millhaven had a lot of curb replacement. So um, we had more than we estimated. And then sidewalk, that looks like a big scary number, but really we only had like 3000 and we, we had to replace almost all the sidewalk on 60th Terrace just because the driveways and the sidewalk had sunk. And so whenever you build them back to ADA, we had to replace those. And then about 11% miscellaneous with sod and manholes and traffic control and pavement markings. Next slide, please. Yes. I had a quick question. Um, and I know I know costs are going up, but based on when we last did our PCI ratings, is it a possibility that the streets had just deteriorated 
significantly more causing the costs to increase like as a portion of whatever that increase was because if say that street was evaluated in I don't know I don't know, when did we do the majority of those 20, 20, 2017 2017 so five years prior to design I think there's a good chance a chunk of that increase was probably just because if that street was only at 15%, it could have, I, just a thought. Well, our pavement costs, Stantec hit those costs really well. It's just there, there was all these other costs. So I think, you know, inflation and uncertainty and just some of those extra costs that you can't know in a Stantec study until you get out and design and you're like, oh, that fence is in the way, I got to relocate that. But to your point, um, and Laura's going to talk about it later that we'd like to go back and run the PCIs again because it's been about five years. So we really need to look at that and see how the streets fare out. And we may reprioritize some streets based on that. A big influence in 2021 was we had a street that was estimated for a UBAS that ended up being mill and overlay based on the condition, field condition, right? On six. Correct. But the pavement. When I went back and looked at the pavement numbers, Stantec was really conservative on that, so it really wasn't the big driver. So we assumed 60th Terrace would be a U-Bass, and we went and looked at it. Water One had had a lot of breaks on that street, and the pavement was in really poor condition. And we had, you know, we talked to the contractor too, and they said, you know, the mill and overlay is going to be your more cost-effective treatment than trying to do a U-Bass and doing all the space repair. So that's what uh, Laura's talking about. Um, so 2022, um, we're getting ready to start and I'll talk about that a little bit more, but the PCI ratings for these streets are 15.4 to 17.7, really, really low. Um, and we originally assumed 2.31 lane miles, but, um, we're actually only going to get 1.41. Um, if you look at the difference between Stantec and the bid price, it's about 53% again, um, <clears throat> and uh, a large part of that is stormwater. So 30% is stormwater. And these numbers are going to go down in future years because really the worst streets usually have the most stormwater needs. So um, the, these streets include um, 61st Street that has a lot of stormwater outlook. Um, is getting a whole new stormwater system. And then there is some stormwater work on Reed's Road. So they will be, this cost is going to go down over time. And we are getting up to $205,000 max reimbursement. So that kind of helps offset some of the costs. Uh, driveways were, approaches were about 4%, erosion 4%, and then miscellaneous about 10%. And if you look down below, you can see the engineer's estimate versus the bid. Um, Olson was really nervous <laughs> about how, what these prices were going to be. And so they, they bid high and then we got this really good price from miles. So that just kind of shows the uncertainty, but I think as we go through this program and we do more full depth, we're going to really get a good handle other than the gas prices and things like that on what it costs and what it takes. So I think we're really going to be able to refine what we do and we're fixing the worst streets. And so in the future, these street costs are, and these stormwater costs are going to go down. Next slide, please. <clears throat> so for our 2022 project status, um, construction is estimated to begin the week of April 18th, barring any supply issues right now they've ordered all the stormwater um, materials so so far it's looking good um, I sent you a copy of the project letter that went out this week and we're updating the website and we're really planning to try to because when you send out a schedule it changes the next day so we're going to try to work on putting updates on the website so if somebody's like you told me this was going to happen why didn't it they can go to the website or they can call us and we um, have a number of project contacts that they can also call for information. So <clears throat> this street, this project includes 62nd Street and Countryside and Reeds and Outlook um, north of 51st Street. I think that's Walnut View. Um, so I just wanted to talk a little bit about the sequence because it's a lot different and it is going to be inconvenience to people, but um, I, our contractors really experienced with this full depth reconstruction and I called some other cities because I was worried about, you know, how does this really work in other cities and they said yeah this is the most efficient way to do it, they get in and get out, but it's going to be a little disruptive. Um, so first of all, <clears throat> excuse me, they install the stormwater pipe 
And then they go in and they remove a section of, they'll start at one end and move a section of pavement, curb, and the driveway approaches. So I think about 500 feet a day is what they said. So they'll start and they'll remove that. So you'll have to be out in your driveway in the morning and they'll give you a door hanger to let you know. And then they'll immediately come behind and backfill with crushed rock. So you'll be able to drive on that. It's just not a driving surface. So some people may not like that, but it, it'll hold the weight. And then they're gonna go back and put in the curb and then they'll do all the pavement and then they'll do the driveway approaches and then restore the site. So when I was a little concerned about why are you doing the driveways after the pavement, get those driveways done so people can get in their, you know, in their driveway. But what they said is they found that if they put the pavement there, that when, if you have to park on the street while they're doing the driveway and cur curing it, then that's usually the best option. So um, <clears throat> people will have special needs and our contractor's really good. I mean, he has a cell phone number that they can call. So, you know, if somebody has some special accommodations, they usually try to work with them. I just want to make sure or confirm that you all received a copy of that letter. And so what you may want to do, I mean, you can always refer people back to us, but you may want to, as we really move into over the next several months, this program, put that cell phone number for the contractor somewhere where you can access it easily. So if you get calls from constituents, you're able to just very quickly pass that, you know, direct them to that, that individual. But I think, you know, as Celia said, there's accommodations for trash, there's accommodations for a whole variety of things. So Hopefully there will be confusion, there always is. Um, but I, I think the letter uh, and the communication approach will be helpful. And you can always refer them to us too, and we'll get to the contractor if we need to, so. I also um, mentioned to Celia that there are a couple of homeowners on 62nd Street that are going through transition. They're selling their home. So trying to notify the new owner uh, that this is gonna happen because they'll be moving in or they'll be purchasing the, the property. So it's important to kind of keep track of that as well. So I was very impressed that Ken knew the, the property owners and the clothing title companies, and I notified them today, and they've already said they're going to share the letter with the homeowner. So I was pretty impressed. <laughs> um, I know. He knows it all. Um, <laughs> so... Um, in 2022, we decided to go over design. And so we designed, we, uh, we were authorized to design rigs, reeds and Beverly along with our 2022 projects. And um, because of the pricing and there was a lot of stormwater work. So we decided to wait to do those in 2023 because we were worried about going over the $2 million. So those are streets that are carrying over for construction in 2023. And then we're recommending 61st Terrace <clears throat> Lamar to Woodson because that's one of our worst streets in the city. And so the price for the 2 million, I'm a little worried about that one again, you know, trying to meet the budget, but I've talked to Laura that we ought to go ahead and design it. And, you know, maybe there's other funds available or maybe we'll hit the mark, you know, or maybe we can use stormwater funds. And I know Laura will talk about that more, but we'd like to go ahead and design that one because I'm not sure it's going to last too much longer. Um, so our next steps would be um, a design contract for 61st Terrace at the next uh, committee meeting, um, completing the design of the other streets. We've received one copy of them and they're 60% design, but we really need to walk the projects once you know the engineers laid it out to really get into the level of detail we need to. And then selecting a curb, sidewalk and striping project for 2022. And um, I was looking at the CIP, we have 50,000 for curb and sidewalk for this year, 100,000 next year. So, um, we're gonna get out there this week and kind of take a look at what are the projects in most need and recommend that project. And then some of the arterials need a refresh of pavement markings. So may have a small striping project. Yes. Is there somewhere that we can see all of the streets and their PCI ratings in order? I have a very large database. Can um, Is that something and, that we could access? Well, I'm, I'm more just, I don't want you to have to go dig in. I'm more curious where 55th Street ranks because I think it's just the worst street in the city other than that one in countryside. So, uh, yes. So um, 
looking at what we originally proposed for 2023, 55th Street was in there, Beverly Drive, a portion of that, and Mill Haven was in there. Beverly Drive has worse pavement than 55th Street, but 55th Street has bad pavement, bad sidewalk, bad curb. So I think overall 55th Street ranks higher, at least the east side of Lamar that I looked at it as um, half of that, you know, half of doing half of that, the, the half closest to Lamar is the worst. So uh, that is what we're recommending as our, one of our next projects. I know Laura is going to talk about different financing options and what we can do. So that is a high priority area. Mm -hmm. We, uh, we were going to apply through Mark and then Mark decided not to do it because they couldn't find somebody to do the analysis. They asked all the cities to group together. So we didn't end up getting that grant. They didn't end up applying for it, unfortunately. Next slide. Is Laura. Okay, this, uh, Laura, this is what matches up with our big page separate handout, right? Yes, for council. because yes. So you don't have to try to pretend you can read anything. I just wanted this to be a reference point. So yes, you have this. It was included in your packet, but in case you didn't bring your packet, this is what I put at your place this evening. So if anybody, I think I got everybody. Um, I did want to just kind of go back to, I saw a lot of heads nodding, but I think Celia's point early, earlier about there will be a tipping point in this 10-year program at which we get through those worst streets and the costs be, become more reasonable and manageable. It's hard. We, we're not sure where that is, and there are a lot of factors influencing that, but that's something that we certainly have our eye on as we think about how to accelerate or move streets forward. Also, just want to acknowledge that probably a lot of what you're seeing with some of the experience in terms of costing in 2021 and 2022 is likely making you even more anxious about wanting to accelerate and figure out how to move faster through this, this next 10-year program. Um, we understand that. And we, as I said, over the, the course of the next several months, um, we'll really try to explore all the options um, that we have. I do have one question as it relates to um, the start of the 2022 residential street program. And I think we had talked about this several months ago. So this is a little bit of a sidebar, but um, typically when we do a cars uh, project, there's a signage that's um, put alongside that project that identifies it as a cars project um, and just helps residents understand um, in our residential street program, because we are making such a significant investment, would you have an interest in creating a pa paving the way signage to remind residents that this is, um, you know, a decision that they were supportive of, and then we could also direct them potentially back to the website. Okay, we can, I, the logo's built, I think we ought to really maximize that communication vehicle. So, okay. One of the things that we talked about um, just a few minutes ago was that the five, our five-year CIP is something that certainly drives our decision-making and our planning uh, and our budgeting and our application for grants um, through these various programs. And so I did want to just kind of talk through, I didn't come up with a whole variety of scenarios for this evening, but as we go through development of the 2023 through 2027 CIP, um, we can certainly play out some more scenarios. So I'd like to start actually on the street uh, program plan side, just kind of a reminder of, um, you see the seven mills dedicated to streets, you see the street sales tax revenues, and you see that that jump. 2022 won't actually get to probably the $900,000 level because we've got this first quarter at the quarter cent and the remainder of the year at three eighths of a cent. Um, you see, see the cars reimbursements, which we actually need to adjust down slightly based on the haircut that they gave us on the Johnson Drive project. Um, and then the SMAC reimbursements, that 155, I believe, was actually for inventory. And so we haven't shown, we know we're getting the $205,000 um, 
for the street program. We should find out as we move in and get to this point in the budget process, whether we got the next round of two, between 250 and $280,000 in SMAC reimbursement. So we will add that into this CIP, which will obviously improve the bottom line. Um, what we don't show here in the out years, um, we show a CARS reimbursement for the um, Johnson Drive Metcalf to Lamar project. Um, where we don't show a SMAC reimbursement and we don't show potentially that STP. We will, as we go through this April um, application submission this Friday and then final kind of decision, we'll, we'll be able in this budget cycle to then plug in either we're getting 2 million or we're getting, you know, whatever the case may be. Um, one of the things that I think Celia talked about, but on the bottom of your slide, as it was talking about the allocations in the various um, grant programs available through MARG, you'll see that there's 20, I think $26 million was the total for STP funding for our, um, is that for the region or that for the Kansas side, Celia? Kansas side. So if you think about the number of projects that are being submitted, we don't submit for that full 80% because it's kind of this guessing game and a little bit of a negotiation uh, dance through that process about what you think you, you know, you'll get. We'll, we'll ask for as much as we think we can and then usually that will um, get reduced somewhat. So there's some opportunities as we move through some grant decisions. Um, as Celia referenced, we applied for um, the base grant uh, through the Department of Commerce. They were supposed to make that announcement in those awards last Friday, and they had so many submissions that they've extended that slightly. Uh, if we're able to, um, to be successful in that process, um, then that will obviously change some of the finances on, on this sheet. But really what I kind of wanted to talk about here was, I mean, you can see some flexibility in 2022, very little sort of ending fund balance. We've sort of maximized everything that we can spend. Um, we know we have talked about the need to issue debt uh, for the Fox Ridge project, as that's a project of the size and scope that we aren't able to cash flow uh, in a particular year. Um, again, we will build out here in the next couple of months as we know what our CARS award and or potentially any other grant awards would be what's actually required in terms of debt proceeds to move forward with that project. So there are no debt proceeds that are shown in this um, 2021 or 2022 through 2026 uh, program. So all of those things will sort of come into play, will improve the bottom line, will give us some flexibility to say, do we want to look at issuing debt for more than just the Fox Ridge project or the Lamar, um, the Johnson Drive project? Can we um, allocate some of that to the residential street program? But we're just a little bit premature in that, in that process. If we flip over to the stormwater side, and one of the things I would be interested in some discussion about is if you look at the ending fund balance in our stormwater utility fund, you can see that it's pretty healthy. And that's because when we put together this program plan, we factored in a $600,000 a year stormwater assessment on the gateway property. Um, if we were to pull that assessment out, if for some reason that project doesn't move forward, they don't continue to pay their taxes, that has a pretty significant impact on the bottom line from a stormwater perspective. Um, but I think, again, as we know that those conversations uh, surrounding that development are coming forward here in the, in the next couple of, uh, couple of months. So I, th I think, um, you know, what, what we can look at right now, I think we're in a good position and we can wait till later in the year to say, do we want to, from a stormwater perspective, for example, take from the stormwater utility fund the difference between the stormwater costs that were identified on a particular street project and what we're getting reimbursed in SMAC and pull that portion out of our stormwater utility fund that creates a little bit more flexibility. Now, it's a little bit of robbing Peter to pay Paul because we know that our stormwater needs throughout the city continue to be significant as well, but that's certainly an option that we can explore to say, can we take advantage of, of some of this, uh, at least right now or in a couple of instances, 
uh, stormwater dollars to help support those. Because as, as you saw, the stormwater was driving in many cases, the cost of the projects up by 30%. So it, it's, real, uh, it's real dollars. So that's again, um, something that, that we would continue to explore through this process. Next slide, please. So in thinking about really what are our options and considerations, uh, we wanted to break that down and we wanted to kind of think about that in terms of how should we think about it in funding the local residential street program and how potentially do we want to think about funding the larger arterial collector projects. So just kind of going through from a local street perspective, I think as you can see, there's still a lot of things in play in terms of design costs, in terms of materials costs, the design and bidding process. And it, we, we've got to kind of find that groove of how to match that up most effectively with our budgeting estimates. Again, once we hit the, that tipping point where full depth three construction is not necessary, we anticipate that project costs will decrease and we can complete more lane miles each year. Um, we would recommend funding a new PCI inventory study late in 2022, and that's about a $20,000 expenditure to ensure that our street conditions, that we're able to take that list of where the PCI rankings and make sure that we don't have, um, you know, utility work um, or stormwater that's degrading the base even further, that's, that's causing significant shifts in the PCI ratings from 2017. And when we went through the presentation of the 10-year street program, that was one of our recommendations, that that PCI inventory should be updated every three to five years just to help make sure you're current with all of that. Um, what we know is that this our local residential street program is probably never going to be a candidate for any sort of external funding. So those dollars are always going to be on our shoulders exclusively. Um, good news and bad news, you know, we know that we have the catching up to do with the construction of, you know, the substandard and, and the three quarters of the street that needs to be um, full depth reconstruction. We need to continue our discussion about how we fund that stormwater portion of full depth reconstruction. Um, and it will be a balancing act with SMAC. So SMAC is, this is the first year where they're even actually funding maintenance projects. So typically they have funded large channel projects. Um, so we're taking advantage and I have to applaud um, Celia and our public work staff for you know, really being on top of that and making application and taking advantage of that. We know that as we come back and start to address some of the remaining Creek channel projects, those are gonna be other dollars that we may be competing for through SMAC. They haven't figured out that process quite yet. Um, so we'll continue to stay connected to that. Um, and then we could, I think, we're, we're not there yet, but I think sometime between now and the end of the year, we could potentially um, accelerate um, the local street program or consider doing that through the use of the ARPA funding that we have, um, excess general fund fund balance. So right now, um, and we'll, we'll come back at your April committee meeting and I'll give you kind of a report on the final rules that were put in place uh, in January for ARPA and calculations for lost revenue and what opportunities we have. Now I think the, the picture is much clearer in terms of how we might be able to take advantage of that. And you may recall that between the 2021 allocation in 2022 were estimated to get about a million and a half dollars. Um, we still uh, preliminarily are looking at um, working through with the auditors and trying to look at what that general fund fund balance and specifically our excess fund balance might be. Um, you have the potential to, you know, always through the budget process, um, although with what we're seeing in it, uh, assessed valuation increases the share. Any conversation about in, uh, increasing mills is probably a challenge, but you always have that flexibility of allocating total mills within your general fund existing mills to what you're dedicating to operations versus capital or debt financing. Um, you know, and again, these will these will all be really central to our budget conversations because. Streets are consistently, as we talked about at the beginning, residents' number one priority. They have been a number one priority for this council. 
Um, but there are a lot of other things that we've talked about that are competing for some of those dollars as well. So we'll try to lay out options and decision packages and where we can maximize that. Yes. I had uh, just a quick question. If our total needs on our streets across the board is $40 million and three fourths of the local streets need full depth, yes. Mm -hmm. um, what, what's that dollar amount? It's about, I think that if I read that Stantec chart right, Celia, I think it's about $29 million. Yeah. Twenty-one. Yeah, close enough. So I I got excited when I know you're not looking for significant feedback yet, but you know I'll always give it. Um, I got excited when I see some some of the more aggressive financing options in terms of thinking about trying to get to twenty-one million dollars as quickly as we can, and thinking about a larger amount up front and then a plan for you know subsequent years if we could get to that, you know, fixing all the full depth within ten years that would be fantastic because then we could think about having a, a real 10-year street program that isn't just a full depth three construction street program. So just a thought. So one thing that that 41 million is, is needs today and I hate to even bring this up because it's depressing, but some of those other good streets are starting to drop down below. So, so we're gonna, it's gonna, you know, if we hit it all, we're still gonna have streets drop below that have to do that. So that's just something to think about. Okay, so very quickly then, as we look at financing options and considerations, our arterials and collectors, again, I think we need to identify and align external funding opportunities with our programming and our five-year CIP and our budget process. Same funding sources are probably available there, ARPA, excess general fund, fund balance, increased mills, debt financing. Uh, again, the, big, the biggest question mark um, in, in terms of the next dollars that we might have to come up with is gonna be this next phase of Johnson Drive. So even if we're successful in an STP application, in a CARS application, uh, and then a SMAC application to potentially extend the interceptor through that portion. Uh, I think, you know, we're estimating it's about the same price tag as that last section that we did. And I think we had to come up with about somewhere between four and a half and $5 million of city dollars to combine with the other people's money to make that project happen. So we would be in a similar boat with that. Again, um, I think by the time we get to you know, August or September, we'll have some clearer direction about what that dollar amount would be. Um, and then, as I mentioned before, we need to really, I think, kind of break off and evaluate and identify other big picture street projects that we may want to take advantage of for uh, future planning and budgeting processes. So next slide, please. Two slides, next one. I'm sorry, I didn't, I'm just not good on the uptick tonight on slide advancing. So we did have and included in your packet, I did not put them in the PowerPoint presentation, but we inclu included the variety of debt scenarios that Ellers, um, Bruce Kimmel with Ellers ran for us just to kind of begin to evaluate the options. And so um, I think if we're successful in what we think we might get with Fox Ridge, um, I think it's probably going to take somewhere in the neighborhood of, you know, two and a half million dollars of city funds to complete that project as anticipated. So that's why we started with the $5 million scenario. $5 million is more than we need for Fox Ridge alone. So you could have some capacity there. Um, then we looked at 8 million saying, okay, if we think about Fox Ridge, if we think about Johnson Drive, and if we think about accelerating the residential program, uh, what, what would that look like? And then 10 million, which I will tell you causes my finance, all this finance cells in my body to constrict a little bit. Um, but we wanted to look at that because I think it's important just to illustrate and think about if we were to really stretch ourselves, what, you know, what would that take? 
Um, and then I asked Bruce, typically, and we have a current debt policy that says it is our goal as a city to retire debt within a 10-year horizon. Okay, and I think that's still a really important goal. And I think that's particularly if we're looking at sales tax revenues that sunset over a 10 year horizon, that's an important thing to consider. Um, but I wanted to show um, in this case, I asked him to run both a 10 year level debt service repayment. We don't like balloon payments at the end. We like level debt service so we can budget and plan appropriately. But I asked him to look at 10 and 15 year scenarios. And I did that because I think it's important if we go back to that slide that talks about the useful service life of full depth reconstruction streets, it's, it extends beyond a 10 year horizon. And so there may be, it may be prudent for us to at least entertain a conversation around an extended life for debt service when we're making those significant investments. I would never come to you and recommend a 15 year debt service if we're doing mill and overlay streets or seal treatments or anything like that. But I think, and we've done that in the past. The only time we've extended beyond that in my tenure here has been with a stormwater project when we've reconstructed channels and we know the life of that channel is probably 25, 30, 40 years. So I think that's something to consider. Our existing debt as it relates to streets um, falls off with uh, this year with the expiration of the plan. So if you go back to the street program plan and the CIP just very quickly, you'll see actually we make that last debt service payment um, in uh, 2023. So next year's budget. Um, so I think you know, the, the, the question is going to be, and if you think about the slide where we talked about existing revenues, we're at, um, you know, $2.3 million that we, um, that we are generating right now. If we say $2 million goes into the residential street program, that leaves you somewhere between three and $400,000, depending on performance that could be allocated to debt service, or you could take a portion of that 2 million if you're accelerating it, and dedicate that to debt service as well. So we'll, again, as we move through the budget process, we'll get much more granular in terms of bringing you options and things that, that we could do. But the, the debt um, financing scenarios that we ran assumed an August 2020 issuance. So we wanted to really kind of align that late enough in our budget process. Could, we could push it a little bit longer um, because we won't need the money for Fox Ridge. So we have money in the bank to do the 2022 program. We don't need any money to do any of that. So the first opportunity that we would need from a cash flow perspective is um, to do the Fox Ridge project. And quite frankly, we have enough, if we need to extend this and make some longer decisions, we have enough general fund fund balance and excess fund balance that we could cash flow that on a shorter term basis. Um, so that assumed an August 2022 issuance. So you'll see he was very conservative. And I think he gave 35 basis points in um, those calculations. So those numbers would likely get better uh, the closer we get to that. We also have a refunding opportunity or refinancing opportunity this year that will provide us some um, additional savings. It's a stormwater issue, but again, if we get some savings on the stormwater side, that may feed into the conversation about can we take stormwater dollars and put it um, towards stormwater and these street projects. We'll have a conversation around the appropriate repayment timeline and our debt policy, um, confirmation of securing external funding and timing related to the debt issuance. We always wanna make sure we have a repayment source and we wanna make sure that we don't, um, you know, that we have a plan. If we, if we look at an extended debt repayment timeline, that extends beyond the life of the current sales tax that we have a really clear plan about how we're going to, to pay for that. You don't wanna leave future councils kind of holding the bag for those price tags. And then um, really, I think as a larger part of that, I think we need to think about as we go through the budget process, our overall debt capacity and what we may want to consider issuing debt for in the future, whether that are parks projects, we know we have some facility needs uh, on the horizon. And so there are statutory debt uh, limitations, particularly when it relates to streets and other things like that. So that will all be part of those considerations. Next slide, which I think is the end. So that's a lot. I know we, um, I hope it was at least 
helpful, informative. Um, it makes my head hurt a little bit as well. Um, but I also think it's exciting. Um, you know, the more experience that we have and the opportunities that we have to connect these dots as we move through our budget process for 2023 and beyond, um, I think it's a really great story to, to share with our community and the investments that we're making. So if there are other questions, comments, thoughts, yeah. I have a question with regards to the contractor that is bidding on the project. How confident are you in that contractor? And the reason I ask that is that we've had some experience in the past where we've had a contractor that did project for us, did not do a very good job, and then went out of business and we had no recourse to deal with the, the guarantee or warranty of the project. So my concern is how confident are we in the contractor? What's the experience we have with them? And, for going forward? Well, we have a performance and maintenance bond. So if for some reason they just flub it up, then you know we can always go back on that. But I've been really impressed with Miles. I mean, they've done a lot of work. They've been around for a while. They do a lot of work in other cities. And our experience with them so far is every, they've been so professional, like they're, we've already met on site on some issues on streets and they just seem to be, have an answer and are very organized. And I don't know, I mean, I hate to, hopefully they come through, but so far, I mean, they, everything that we hear and have experience with that, I think they're going to do a good job. They did. So what was their they, they were the contractor on the null project. What did you think? Yeah. I mean, don't you think that yeah, haven't you been impressed with everything they've done yeah. so far? Done yeah. Thanks, Laura. Yeah. Um, great presentation, both. That was really informative, especially on the heels of NLC, kind of hearing a lot of these. Uh, discussions floating around. It's nice to kind of get some closure on local applications. Really helpful for me. So appreciate that. Had a question related to the general obligation bonds. Mm -hmm. And I didn't know if there were any discussions with Bruce on, I guess I have two questions. Is, is there any time frame slash urgency that was discussed in light of the Fed potentially raising rates? And Maybe that, that's one thing. And then I just didn't know if he kind of charted out scenarios for higher interest rates on any of those as well, if they were, or if they were just kind of assuming current status. Uh, he always keeps an eye on that. I mean, I think the reality is that even as, as interest rates start to creep back up, where we, we just get good rates as a municipality and with particularly with the bond rating that we have. Um, and so we can certainly, as we start to explore or narrow our focus, we can ask for more detail. And, and I do want to say, I mean, I think you all know this, but I want to be very deliberate in saying 5 million, 8 million, 10 million are not the only scenarios. Um, obviously, if we wanted a seven and a half million dollars or a five and a, you know, whatever, there, there's any range of option in there. We just have to sort of target what we want in terms of net um, debt proceeds. Uh, for that, but we will factor in. I mean, I think the urge, I think the challenge right now is having enough good data to make that decision about how much we think we really need. And so that's why we asked him to really push this out a little bit further to look at that consideration. Um, I mean, the beauty of low interest rates is that if we get money and it sits in the bank, we aren't paying arbitrage on it because we're not earning any money on the money that that we issue, you know, issue debt on, but it's a pain to do the reporting for that if you have money sooner than what you really need it. So we really try to time that. And I think this would be um, one of the, I'm, I'm sort of in my mind envisioning that we might um, eventually come together on something that does a combination of either Fox Ridge and, and Johnson Drive and the local program in one debt issue. And so th this would be kind of the first time it, it's not, it's absolutely doable, but I think making sure that you distinguish the amounts and then we can track in a variety of different fashions. So I think I need to be clear and we all need to be clear um, on kind of what that looks like and how we would structure uh, that going forward. 
The one thing that I did want to say, um, wait, well, we'll go with any other questions and then, yeah, Debbie. I just have a comment. In my 22 years here, I have never been prouder of the staff we have in every department that's making sure that we are protected. There's no municipal liability or anything relative to what we're spending money on and how we're spending it. So I can tell you right now, this is a phenomenal staff and that makes me feel better every time I look at a figure on one of these sheets. Just as an outside comment, um, I have grave concerns at some point down the line if there's any pathway of gaining additional revenue on our constituents. I don't think there's been a, a place in time that they've ever had property valuations look like they do right now. Some of these people are living from hand to mouth, month to month on just buying groceries and putting gas in their cars. So I just think as we look down the road, some of these people are on severe strict and restricted incomes. We really need to look at that. So mill levy would be at the bottom of my list relative to looking at the, the people that have made this city what it is. The other thing that I did not touch on, and I'll just touch briefly on it because it's coming uh, in, in future conversations. So I'll sort of roll this into, I um, sent an email I think last Friday saying, please hold every Wednesday. Um, we have so many things coming at us, whether that's the budget, whether that's conversations around the gateway development, whether that's conversations around the block development, um, climate action plan. There's just a whole lot of really meaty, um, weighty subjects that we, we need to talk about. Um, and, but it's tricky, again, some of this timing. So for example, the community center feasibility study is underway and we're moving to align some of those recommendations with our budget process, which is gonna impact other funds that might be available to dedicate to streets. So there's a whole lot of things and a lot of interplay in all of these pieces. And that happens every year, but I think this year in particular, uh, that's an even highlight. So if you can, um, please reserve that. Um, I think we've confirmed we also are having our facilitated uh, council retreat on Saturday, May 7th. Um, we'll be sending out some additional information on that this week and then probably next next week as, as well. But one of the things um, to think about, um, and I think it's important to think about our needs and our priorities as we move into these conversations with developers as they request incentives, um, think back to the work, work session that we had uh, last month or or so on incentives and how I like to approach it. And that is if the developer's coming with a handout, I'm gonna come with my handout and say what's in it for us as a city, right? And so, um, uh, you know, I know in the past and one of the things that we'll be bringing forward um, for you all to really understand is we're in the process of sort of quantifying um, on a, on a gateway development in particular because there's sales tax that's generated, what that could mean for us. And so on projects in, in that instance, and I think it's important to note that um, dedicated sales tax like parks and recreation or streets are not captured, have not historically been captured as a part of any of those development agreements. And so um, they can contribute significantly to the revenue streams that, that we have available and will be we'll be blending that in, in our considerations and conversations as we move forward. And I think that's all we have this evening. All right, thank you, Laura. I guess with that, we are adjourned. <laughs>